Today's lecture is part of my series called Chemistry for Understanding Nutrition. This is on protein. And as we know, protein is of paramount importance because the minute you tell someone that you've gone plant-based, <laughs> everyone becomes a nutrition expert and instantly begins to worry about whether or not you're going to become protein deficient. Who's been to a hospital within the last five to 10 years? Okay. To been to, yeah, to visit. Yeah. You went to see somebody who had what? Heart attack, stroke, operation for something? Anybody ever been to see someone who was uh, dying of protein deficiency because they went vegan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a quote from the book of Psalms. It says, God rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Even when God chooses to feed us, he feeds us with plants. This is just a pretty picture of a protein crystal. So we're going to start off talking about exactly what is protein. You can't talk about protein without talking about plants because plants are nature's alchemists. They literally conjure the stuff of life, everything that we know and use out of thin air. I mean, plants are truly amazing. Using nothing but sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, plants manufacture the sugars that actually give our world its shape and structure and energy. And then they take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and transform it into the amino acids that make up the proteins that make up the tissues of all living things. So next time you see a tree, hug it. <laughs> Carbohydrates are plant-derived compounds made up literally of the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And carbohydrate literally means hydrated carbon. And so you see that what plants do is they take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combine it with water, and turn it into uh, these five and six carbon sugar molecules using the energy of the sun. And these carbon backbones are then uh, attached to nitrogen-containing amino groups to make up amino acids, which are then joined together to make proteins. The five carbon uh, sugars are called pentoses. The six carbons are called hexoses. Everybody with me so far? Anything confusing? And if it is, don't be afraid to say so, because I'm a chemistry geek, and so I get all excited about this, but this may look foreign to you guys. No question. So if I give you uh, the quiz that I brought with me at the end of this, you're going to be able to <laughs> label all these things and tell me how they combine, right? OK, see, I knew there was a question somewhere. <laughs> Exactly. All living things. I mean, you know, they're the rocks and things like that. But yes, all living things start off uh, as some form of a carbohydrate. All right, so let's talk about amino acid synthesis. This is like really kind of cool because actually what happens is plants take in carbon dioxide through their leaves, but they take in the nitrogen that will eventually uh, go into the amino acids and proteins through their roots. And they uh, oftentimes work in conjunction with bacteria to break apart the nitrogen molecule and turn it into either NO3 or ammonium ion that then gets incorporated into the amino acids. Don't worry about how complicated that diagram is. It's just to show you that this stuff really happens. <laughs> so symbiotic bacteria working in concert with the plants help them break apart the nitrogen and then incorporate it into these amino groups. And these newly synthesized amino acids are then formed into proteins. Proteins are made up of individual building blocks called amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids that make up the proteins of all living things, plants and animals. And humans can make all but eight of them, nine if you're a baby. Um, and the nine that we can't make are called essential amino acids and have to be obtained either from the diet or mother's milk. Uh, when we're babies, we really can't make taurine, uh, but that's supplied in mother's milk. And then as we become adults, we uh, acquire the ability to make taurine. The nitrogen in the amino acids comes from atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen gas is one of the most inert and unreactive uh, molecules in the known universe. Uh, nitrogen atoms are triple bonded to one another, and they just don't come apart for any reason. Only plants working together with the bacteria can do this. And this is the fundamental point I want you guys to take home. 
all protein is initially made by plants. Okay? Now, is that confusing to anybody? The, the point is this, if you were to trace the nitrogen in the proteins that our body makes back, it ultimately comes from a plant. So it's just like um, this cabinet here is made out of metal, these chairs have metal frames, and I can strip the metal frames from these chairs, I can take this cabinet, I can get a couple of toasters and maybe the frame for this uh, screen, thank you, and I can ship that, all that metal to a factory that makes cars. And it can melt the metal down and then refashion it into car parts. So, but that factory did not make that steel. It only recycled it. Is that understandable? So, yes, when the, our bodies can recycle the amino acids that we eat into new proteins, but it did not make those amino acids initially. It is only tearing them apart and recycling them. All protein has to initially come from a plant source. Meaning if all the plants in the world died off, everything else in the world would die off. So the question was, um, does that mean that all of the protein that we get from animals is recycled plant protein? And yes, that is exactly right. And my suggestion is to cut out the middleman. <laughs> So the question was, what is the source of the bacteria that work with the plants to uh, uh, make the amino acids? And it's just soil bacteria. And, but it's, it's specialized soil bacteria, bacteria that actually will um, uh, gravitate towards specific plants. And that's why um, I've come to understand and realize that soil, plants, these are really complex ecosystems. And it's not just as simple as sticking a plant in some dirt. You have to build up, build up this complex web of bacteria and even fungi are involved because fungi have the ability to break down like dead leaves, dead wood into their you know, minerals and old amino acids that can then be uh, taken up by the plants and reutilized. And the quality of the soil is of paramount importance. All nutrients come from the sun or the soil. Vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, is created when skin is exposed to sunlight. Everything else comes from the ground. Minerals originate from the earth, and vitamins from the plants and microorganisms that grow from it. The calcium in a cow's milk and her 200-pound skeleton came from all the plants she ate, which drew it up from the soil. We can cut out the middle moo, though, and get calcium from the plants directly. Where do you get your protein? Protein contains essential amino acids, meaning our bodies can't make them, and so are essential to get from our diet. But other animals don't make them either. All essential amino acids originate from plants and microbes, and all plant proteins have all essential amino acids. The only truly incomplete protein in the food supply is gelatin, which is uh, missing the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, so the only protein source that you couldn't live on is jello. As I covered previously, those eating plant-based diets average about twice the average requirement for protein. Those who don't know where to get protein on a plant-based diet don't know beans. Get it? That's protein quantity, though. What about protein quality? The concept that plant protein was inferior to animal protein arose from studies performed on rodents more than a century ago. Scientists found that infant rats don't grow as well on plants, but infant rats don't grow as well on human breast milk either. So does that mean we shouldn't breastfeed our babies? Ridiculous. They're rats. Rat milk has 10 times more protein than human milk, because rats grow about 10 times faster than human infants. It's true that some plant proteins are relatively low in certain essential amino acids, so about 40 years ago the myth of protein combining came into vogue. Literally, the February 75 issue of Vogue magazine. The concept 
was that we needed to eat complementary proteins together, for example, rice and beans, to make up for their relative shortfalls. This fallacy was refuted decades ago, the myth that plant proteins are incomplete, that plant proteins aren't as good, that one has to combine proteins at meals. These have all been dismissed by the nutrition community as myths decades ago. But many in medicine evidently didn't get the memo. Dr. John McDougall called out the American Heart Association for a 2001 publication that questioned the completeness of plant proteins. Thankfully, though, they changed and acknowledged now that plant proteins can provide all the essential amino acids, no need to combine complementary proteins. It turns out our body is not stupid. It maintains pools of free amino acids that can be used to do all the complementing for us, not to mention the massive protein recycling program our body has. Some 90 grams of protein is dumped into the digestive tract every day from our own body to get broken back down and reassembled, so our body can mix and match amino acids to whatever proportions we need, whatever we eat making it practically impossible to even design a diet of whole plant foods that's sufficient in calories but deficient in protein. Thus, plant-based consumers do not need to be at all concerned about amino acid imbalances from the plant proteins that make up our usual diets. So again, proteins perform a wide variety of uh, functions in our body, including tissue building. They catalyze energy metabolism, as well as serving as neurotransmitters, hormones, and transport vehicles such as the hemoglobin, which transports oxygen around our body. Proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids joined by bonds that are called peptide bonds. And all amino acids contain, as I said, the element nitrogen in the form of an amino group attached to a carbon skeleton. And human tissues, like all living tissues, are made up of protein. So tissues as different as the clear cornea covering our eyes, the iris muscle that forms our pupil, the white sclera, our, the hair of our eyelashes, the cartilage in our nose, or the proteins in our skin, all made up of protein. And so what you can see is that protein is an amazing substance because just based on the differing ratios of amino acids, you can make materials as different as hair and the clear cornea. I mean, it's really incredible. Just the idea of how you utilize protein can be compared to how you build a house. So building a body is like building a home. Your proteins are your building materials, right? So the, how much building material you will need depends on the size of the house and also how many houses you're building. If you're building a new development, you need a whole bunch of, of building materials. If you are, you know, uh, some guy who's building a tiny house out in the woods, you don't need that much. So again, how much proteins you need depend on how big a building you're building, and also how fast you're building that building. So if you're building a house, but you plan to take a year to build it, do you need a semi to dump a load of building materials in your, in the, uh, at the building site every week? Of course not, because you can't utilize it. So you want your rate of delivery, i.e. your protein consumption, to equal your rate of utilization, that is your growth or your repair rate. So in other words, we should only eat as much protein as we can use because there's no advantage to eating excess protein. But there's some distinct disadvantages as we'll discuss. Once your building is completed, do you still need that semi-truck coming around every week? No, you don't. Once your building is complete, you don't need the same amount of protein being delivered because now you're in maintenance phase. So now you only need to get sheetrock if you punch a hole in the wall. You only need shingles if the roofs start to leak. And you don't need enough shingles to replace the whole roof, just the part that's leaking. Yes, ma'am. I know some bodybuilders who... Are eating all kinds of crap, including protein shakes, right? They're making very expensive pea and manure. <laughs> are, they 
Are they doing harm to themselves? Yes, they are. And we're going to talk about that. Yes, that is not good because you, you're not using it as protein and you are doing potential harm to your body. Okay, and we'll talk about that as well. Well, if you continue delivering building materials to a completed building, this is what you end up with. And an organic pile of rubble is a tumor. That's why people end up developing these things like lipomas and uterine fibroids and uh, cysts in the breast and skin tags and skin growths because they're, they're delivering stuff to their body that the body really can't use and it stimulates the body to form these benign tumors. But it can get worse than that because you can get bizarre additions and those are your cancers. And all of these things have been connected to and associated with excess intake of protein, particularly animal protein. And let's talk about why that is. All right, well, this is just a picture of a number of different proteins and enzymes. There are 20 different amino acids. All proteins, both animal and plant proteins, are made up of the same 20 amino acids. The differences are the differences in relative amounts. And humans have the enzymes to make all but eight of the 20 as adults, and those eight are what are known as the essential amino acids. The essential amino acids for humans are tryptophan, valine, methionine, isoleucine, threonine, lysine, leucine, and phenylalanine. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, uh, someone um, said that we were uh, a product of intelligent design, which is something I happen to believe. Um, but the question is, well, if we are um, intelligently designed, why can't we make all of the uh, 20 amino acids? One, that's a question you have to wait and ask God. <laughs> but two, I think it's so that we could have the fun of eating. I, I really don't have an answer for that, except that um, you know, it takes energy to make anything. The fact that we allow the plants to make um, eight of these amino acids means that we don't have to have the enzymes to make them, so we can use that energy for something else. All right, these are the other non-essential amino acids. Uh, tyrosine, proline, glycine, histidine, serine, and glutamine. And I just look how complicated these things are. Now, how many of you were at the um, plenary on uh, so-called lab-grown meat? All right, remember I kept talking about how the heck do these people plan to make these things? The chemical processes for trying to make these really complicated amino acids are extremely energy intensive and use some very toxic reagents. That's why this pipe dream people have that trying to grow meat in a lab is going to be this easy, wonderful, you know, uh, seamless process uh, is just ludicrous. This is not like the um, fairy tale of Rumpelstiltskin. You remember that? The guy would go to sleep and he'd wake up and there's all these shoes. Well, that ain't going to happen in a lab. You're not going to go to sleep and wake up to all this meat. What you're going to wake up to is a disaster. <laughs> This just shows the relationship between protein and carbohydrate metabolism. So if you start out with protein, you can either use the protein for structure. It can become enzymes or hormones or actual body tissues or neurotransmitters. But let's say you eat 60 grams of protein and you only need 35 for this part. Well, the rest of it then comes over here. The amino, acid, the amino group is stripped off and then the carbon backbone becomes carbohydrate and it can either be burned as energy. It can be used from uh, structures that utilize uh, uh, carbohydrates, or it can be stored in the form of glycogen, which is animal starch. And if your glycogen uh, pools are full, then and only then will it go into your fat cells. But the reason your body does not like to try and turn carbohydrate into fat is that fat has a lot more energy than carbohydrate. And so it actually has to put energy into the uh, carbohydrate molecule in order to turn it into fat. And that, re again, requires a lot more energy. 
Uh, you have to put about 25% of the uh, more energy into it. And rather than do that, your body would prefer to force you to burn that carbohydrate off. And so what happens when you eat a lot of simple carbohydrates? You get a sugar bus. Exactly. That's why kids start bouncing off the walls and running around, because their body's trying to force them to burn that carbohydrate off rather than store it. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, and Dr. in the video I showed, Dr. Greger said our body dumps about 90 grams of protein into our digestive tract, breaks it down and recycles the amino acids. Where does that protein come from? Every day, the entire lining of your gastrointestinal tract is sloughed off and digested and reabsorbed. That's where that protein comes from. So we self-destruct the results every day? Well, uh, or, or it's more like renew ourselves. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and here are some very important points. Our bodies cannot store protein. All right, we're going to say that together, and I want everybody in this room to say this. Our bodies cannot store protein. Okay, we're going to have to say it again, because I'm, I'm looking at this guy right back here, and he didn't say it. So we're going to say it again. Our bodies cannot store protein. All right, cool. Everybody's with me. That is critically important for everybody to understand because it doesn't make sense to eat huge amounts of steak or chicken or whatever because it doesn't do you any good. Protein is not money. There's no bank for it. So there's no advantage to eating more than you can use. Again, no advantage to consuming excess. As I said, all that's not used for building purposes is converted to carbohydrate. And again, this is why um, excess animal protein is so deleterious to our skeletons because the sulfur that is in these animal proteins comes, gets converted into a sulfurous acid, not sulfuric, which would melt our bodies, but sulfurous, which is a weak acid, but is acid nonetheless. And our bodies have to buffer that acid. And so what our bodies will do is dissolve phosphate from our bones to um, buffer and neutralize that acid, but that means that the calcium that was in those bones ends up coming out in our urine. And that's another reason why high protein diets are um, associated with an elevated risk for kidney stones. And plant proteins are always buffered by phosphate, and so they don't cause the same level of acidification. And as a result, Women who are on plant-based diets have higher bone mineral density both before and after menopause than women who eat meat. So major determinants of protein utilization. Uh, number one, making sure you just get enough protein. The recommendations are half a gram to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. That is m enough plus a margin of safety. Okay, you take it in more than that, you're not utilizing it, it's coming out in the pee and the toilet. Adequate energy. Now that's really, really key because if you're not taking in enough energy, instead of utilizing the protein for building tissue, your body is going to burn it for energy. Okay? And the way I want you to think of this is, let's say you're trying to build a cabin out in, you know, Alaska, where it gets very cold during the winter. And you know, you're trying to complete a room on that cabin. But um, turns out you didn't get enough wood to complete the room and um, fire your wood burning stove. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to use the little bit of wood you have to try and complete that room and freeze to death? Or are you going to keep the fire going so you'll stay alive? You use it for energy to keep yourself alive. Same thing with our bodies. You obviously have to have an adequate intake of essential amino acids, which is not hard to do. And uh, as Michael pointed out in the video, protein complementing is absolutely not necessary. And it turns out that maintaining regular exercise helps your body utilize uh, its proteins more efficiently. And it says, down to the bottom, most Americans, including vegetarians and vegans, get uh, one and a half to two times as much protein as they need on a daily basis. So, questions. If I'm working out, do I need extra protein? The general answer is no. Why? Well, well but let's say you start, you start to work out. You decide, you know what, I'm tired of sitting on the couch and being a couch potato and looking like the couch. I'm going to go and start working out. Do you need to take in extra protein? Huh? Take in extra calories. 
You need extra energy. But why don't you, but you're trying to build muscle, so why don't you need extra protein? Remember what I said, at baseline, you're already getting um, about twice as much protein as you can use anyway. So you already have um, that extra, whatever extra you're gonna need, you already have that built in. And yes, what you will need is the extra energy more than the extra protein, yes. And, and just increasing the energy intake, you're right, that's gonna give you additional protein as well. So that's not something you have to worry about. All of these protein drinks are a complete waste. And uh, the other important point for people who are plant-based, most of those uh, protein drinks are dairy-based. They're either whey or casein. So stay away from them. If you feel like, let's say you're, you start training for a marathon, but you also want to get leaner, so you are really restricting your calories and you want to try and you know, sort of up your protein game, use pea powder or soy powder based uh, protein drinks, if you must use a protein drink. Okay, yes sir. So the question was, if you're running a marathon, do you need extra protein or do you need extra energy in the form of coconut oil? If you're running a, pro, uh, a marathon and you're doing that kind of really heavy, intensive exercise, you do need to in take in more fat because what you need is more energy and uh, essentially, you won't be able to eat enough like roughage and, and so forth to get that amount of energy. So by upping the amount of fat in your diet, you can get the extra energy you need and that will spare the protein to be used as protein. What type of protein is better for us, uh, animal or, or plant protein? Plants. Okay, is there anybody that says animal? Okay, good. I didn't want to have to flunk you. <laughs> Are protein needs increased in patients with medical illnesses or trauma, like somebody who's been in a car accident? Yes. Yes. Because when you're sick, your body becomes much less efficient at utilizing the protein. So protein needs in those special, specialized segments, or if you're involved like a motor vehicle accident where you get a crush injury, yeah, you do need more protein because you have a lot of replacement. Yes, ma'am. Um, For something like a concussion, you really wouldn't need more than you're already taking in because you've got that safety margin. margin. I'm, I'm talking about uh, somebody who is, say, involved in a motor vehicle accident and has like a crush injury or, you know, someone who has like, you know, a major sepsis where, you know, they've got uh, a lot of tissue damage and, and inflammation. So what do you do yes. If you the question is, what do you do if you have a trauma patient who comes in who also has kidney disease? That's where you have to have a good nutritionist at the hospital because you have to figure out how to balance the extra protein needs without uh, overwhelming that patient's kidneys. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What about elderly? Sure. So the question is, what about elderly people who may not be absorbing uh, protein well? There really isn't a sound reason why even an older person doesn't absorb protein unless there's something wrong with their digestive tract. So if I had an, uh, somebody brought their, say their elderly parent in and said, you know, my mom is losing weight and we don't think she's absorbing her protein or whatever, I would look for a problem in the digestive tract such as bacterial overgrowth or something like that that's interfering with the ability of her intestines to do their job because otherwise she should not have a problem with absorbing her proteins. And can protein be burned as protein? Yeah, I'll answer that question for me. No, exactly. It's got to be converted to carbohydrate first. All right, it says these new, <laughs> these new food labels are a bit more candid, but don't let that scare you. I wish they would put that out there like that. Uh, traditional uh, Western dogma says that animal protein is higher quality because it's close in composition to our own tissues. This no uh, notion grows out of the uh, faulty assumption that it is always best to consume proteins that are close to our own tissues. Well, that's a reason to eat each other, okay? I mean, really, that's, that's an argument for cannibalism. Uh, cow, pig, chicken, and fish flesh is not human flesh. The largest, strongest land animals are all strict herbivores, so it's not necessary to eat flesh to make flesh. The best human flesh is made by providing our bodies with the amino acids it needs in appropriate amounts, and it'll do all the rest. All of the research shows that plant proteins are the best for our health. Yes, sir. I think that's what's triggering a lot of the 
that, that is absolutely true, and we're, we're going to talk about that. So what he said was that um, he thinks that a lot of the problems that we have with the diseases we're seeing, including autoimmune diseases, is because we're consuming uh, animal tissue, and that's absolutely true. So animal protein uh, has been linked to a number of diseases, including heart disease, cancers, uh, diabetes, osteoporosis, prion diseases, Alzheimer's and other dementias, high blood pressure, stroke, uh, kidney failure, kidney stones, uh, dysentery, foodborne illnesses, both meat and dairy are potent cancer promoters, uh, and then studies suggest putrefaction of animal protein residues in our colon releases toxins that exacerbate problems like depression, mood and behavior disorders, ADHD. The amino acid composition of uh, animal protein also increases something called homocysteine, which damages not only our blood vessels, but also our bones and hurts our brains as well. Clearly, wrong signals lead to disasters. So, at what point in these animals' lives do they eat animal protein? When they're babies. All right, I heard none, and then I heard when they're babies. <laughs> let's, let's come to it. You guys talk amongst yourselves, <laughs> and then give me one answer. <laughs> when they're babies. Exactly. And because of that, <laughs> right. And so, but what that means is animal protein for plant-eating animals is a growth signal. Wrong signals end up giving abnormal growth and poor health. Herbivorous mammals should only be exposed to animal proteins during early infancy when they're in their rapid growth phase. Animal protein is a potent growth signal to herbivorous animals. If herbivores are exposed to animal proteins when they're adults, it activates oncogenes or cancer genes that can uh, lead to abnormal growth and lead to tumor development and cancers, okay? Because as an adult, your cells should not be trying to grow. Does that, I, I, that, this is key. I want everybody to really get this. Does this not make, does this not quite make sense to anybody? Honestly, do not be afraid to ask, ask questions because that's why we're here, is to get all of these questions answered, make sure everybody gets this. Because I want you all to run home and get on the phone with your relatives and say, stop eating that shit. You're stimulating cancer cells. Um, so his, the question is, he heard that methionine restriction or limitation helps prevent cancer development, but What's confusing is methionine is, a, is an essential amino acid, right? And if it's essential, why is it that limiting it helps you be healthier? So does anybody use heating oil here in their homes or propane? Yes. Okay. How often do you buy, purchase propane? Uh, the truck comes about once every five weeks. Okay, every five weeks. And about how much do you purchase? Okay, all right, well let's say every five weeks she purchases 40 gallons of propane. And that helps you run your stove, heat your house, everything's cool, right? Well, I tell you what, we're gonna start putting in 120 gallons of propane in your house every five weeks. Okay, we're just gonna stuff it wherever we can find it. What's gonna happen to her home? It's gonna blow up, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's, it's a similar thing. When you take it in the right physiologic amount, your body utilizes it and does what it's supposed to. When you start getting too much, you stimulate these cancer genes. Is that, is that clear? All right. And we'll see that a little more clearly as we move on. It says, bass backwards and completely wrong. Plant-based diets are often discussed in terms of being as good as meat-containing diets, but this is absolutely backwards. Um, it turns out that, uh, as we know, research shows that plant-based diets are healthiest for us, but the early researchers got it wrong. Common myths and misperceptions that still exist about plant-based diets is you can't get enough ad uh, protein on a vegan diet. We know that's not true. Plant proteins are not complete. We know that's not true. Uh, animal protein is better quality. We'll talk about why that is complete elbow bovine fertilizer. Calcium is hard to come by. We've already dismissed that one. And it's difficult to build muscle on the vegan diet. And we'll look at uh, some evidence that that's not true. So looking at plant versus animal protein effects, early nutrition researchers discovered that animal proteins had higher percentages of essential a certain essential amino acids, okay? And that's true. Animal proteins do have higher amounts of specific 
essential amino acids. And they assumed that that meant that those proteins were better quality. And they assumed this because they assumed that the closer the animal protein was to our own tissues, the better it was for us. But as we already discussed, that's an argument for cannibalism, which doesn't make sense. I already mentioned for a plant-eating mammal, animal protein is a growth stimulant and a growth signal. Therefore, uh, and animal protein turns on growth genes called TOR genes, and we'll talk about that, which increase levels of growth hormones like uh, insulin, like growth factors and others uh, in these animals. And um, getting back to the point that you made a minute ago, we know that uh, mammal tissue such as um, uh, beef and pork and lamb um, tend to cause more heart disease and more cancer than, slightly more, than poultry or, or uh, fish or uh, shellfish. And I think that the reason that these uh, other types of flesh is somewhat less carcinogenic is because their tissues are actually less like ours than the mammal tissue. So uh, TOR genes function as master regulatory genes for cell proliferation and growth. So when TOR genes, and TOR stands for target of rapamycin, and how did it get that name? Well, um, when people started transplanting kidneys, they came up with this drug, uh, rapamycin, um, that uh, uh, helped prevent organ rejection. But what they discovered to their amazement was that when they gave people um, rapamycin, it actually caused skin cancers to regress. And they're like, oh my God, what is happening? And they looked for the enzymes and the enzyme systems that this rapamycin was targeting, and they realized that it was these growth genes, and they called these genes TOR, target of rapamycin. And normally, these TOR genes are only active during our rapid growth phase as infants. And animal intake increases TOR activity. And the essential amino acid leucine has the greatest stimulatory impact on these TOR genes and their expression and activity. Well, decreasing animal protein intake decreases TOR activity. It also suppresses insulin-like growth factor levels. TOR genes are upregulated in human cancers. They're also covered in IGF-1 receptors, uh, human cancers are. IGF-1 levels have been shown to be 9 to 13% lower in vegan men and women versus people who are eating uh, uh, meat. And in one landmark study that lasted for 18 years, people with higher animal protein intakes had a 75% higher overall mortality and a four-fold increase in cancer death. Well, why is that? What the heck is going on? Well, again, the reason early nutrition researchers thought that animal proteins were higher quality was because they had more leucine, right? And because leucine was an essential amino acid, they thought more is good. No, more is not good. Mammalian milks have a lot of leucine. Why? Because mammalian babies are supposed to be growing. But once, so let's just think about a cow. When a cow is a calf, it's going to be drinking milk, it's getting a lot of leucine, it's telling its body, grow, grow, grow. That's exactly what should be happening. But what happens once that calf gets to be an adolescent and then an adult? It switches to its normal diet, which are plant foods, which are much lower in leucine. It's enough leucine to keep it healthy, but not enough to make it develop a cancer. You get it? That's why the plant proteins are better. This is why the animal proteins cause cancer development. This is why the plant proteins are protective. They have enough leucine to keep you healthy, but they don't have so much that they turn on cancer genes. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. So what you're really saying is the cows are smart enough to get off milk, but we're not smart enough to get off Well, actually, all mammals except humans are smart enough to get off milk. Absolutely. That's the entire issue. And, and that, but that's also why we shouldn't be eating these other uh, animal proteins either. Eggs, fish, and uh, meat. Same problem, too much leucine. Yes, I saw. Oh, what does the word upregulated mean? It means turns on, turned on. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, yes, sir, Rich. Uh, 
Oh, no, no. No, what, they're, what they use in the space shuttle is liquid hydrogen. Yeah, because um, they use liquid nitrogen to remove, like, moles and warts because it'll get very cold, but it won't react with your tissues. So that's why they can freeze things off. But it's, it, it's, it won't ignite because it, it's inert. It won't react. Liquid hydrogen will explode. <laughs> yeah, it's like a super Hindenburg. So again, TOR genes are upregulated in human cancers, mean, meaning that you look at those cancer cells, those TOR genes are very active. Why? Because they're telling those cancer genes, grow, 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 grow. Uh, leucine has the greatest effect. Animal protein increases both TOR expression, meaning it turns on these TOR genes, and it also increases the level of insulin-like growth factor, which is a hormone that also stimulates uh, cell growth. So you see, you got a multi-hit phenomenon going on. You got the genes themselves being turned on, and you got growth hormones that being, are being secreted that also increases growth activity. Yes, sir? Okay, so the, uh, the question the gentleman asked, he said that um, I had uh, uh, mentioned that you could use soy uh, protein uh, if you wanted to use a protein drink, but that he had heard that soy protein uh, could increase IGF-1 levels as well. And um, it's interesting because soy protein is one of the few plant proteins that kind of closely mimics the composition of animal proteins. So, uh, you should be judicious in its use, yes. What about pea protein? Pea protein is very different. Pea protein is kind of typical plant protein. It's got much lower levels of, of leucine, all right? Animal proteins also have a much higher content of methionine, which also promotes cancer development. And the other thing methionine does is it ages your mitochondria. It uh, causes a lot of cellular, uh, intracellular oxidation and ages your mitochondria, and as your mitochondria wear out, so do you. Animal protein accelerates kidney damage, increases heart disease, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, inflammation, bone loss, and uh, so on and so forth. Got a question real quick? Yes, ma'am, your question. Um, is the strep in pea protein? Okay, so the, the question is that she's heard that um, sometimes in the processing of pea protein, they use a gas called hexane, which can be toxic. I, the, what I can say generally is that I'm not really well versed in that issue, but that if you decide to use one of these products, it is really important to see where it's sourced and how it's produced. Would that be more true with isolates? Yeah, uh, clearly, yeah, because isolates by definition are more processed. And again, for, for almost everyone, you don't need it anyway, so it's best just to stay away from it. Only about 1 in 10,000 people make it to be 100 years old. What's their secret? Well, in 1993, a major breakthrough in longevity research was published. A single genetic mutation that doubled the lifespan of a tiny roundworm. Instead of all being dead by 30 days, the mutants lived 60 days or longer. This lifespan extension was the largest yet reported in any organism. This Methuselah worm, medical marvel, is the equivalent of producing a healthy 200-year-old human, all because of a single mutation? Uh, that shouldn't happen. I mean, presumably aging is caused by multiple processes, many genes. How could just knocking out one gene double the lifespan? What is this aging gene anyway? This gene that so speeds up aging that if it's knocked out, the animals live twice as long. It's been called the Grim Reaper gene. What is it? It's the worm equivalent of the human IGF-1 receptor. And mutations of that same receptor in humans may help explain why some people live to be 100 and other people don't. So is it just the luck of the draw, whether we got good genes or bad? No, we can turn on and off the expression of these genes depending on what we eat. Three years ago, I profiled a remarkable series of experiments about IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, this cancer-promoting growth hormone released in excess amounts by our liver when we eat animal protein. So men and women 
who don't eat meat, egg white, or dairy proteins have significantly lower levels circulated within their bodies. Switching people to a plant-based diet can significantly lower IGF-1 levels within just 11 days markedly, improving the ability of women's bloodstreams to suppress breast cancer growth and then kill breast cancer cells off. Similarly, the blood serum of men on plant-based diets suppresses prostate cancer cell growth about eight times better than before they changed their diet. This dramatic improvement in cancer defenses is, however, abolished if you add back just the amount of IGF-1 banished from their systems because they're eating and living healthier. This is one way to explain the low rates of cancer among plant-based populations. The drop in animal protein intake leads to a drop in IGF-1, which leads to a drop in cancer growth, an effect so powerful Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues appear to be able to reverse the progression of early-stage prostate cancer without chemo, surgery, or radiation, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle changes. Now, when we're kids, we need growth hormones to grow. I mean, there's a rare genetic defect that causes severe IGF-1 deficiency, leading to a type of dwarfism, but it also apparently makes you effectively cancer-proof. Not a single death from cancer in about 100 individuals with IGF-1 deficiency. How about 200 individuals? None developed cancer. See, most malignant tumors are covered in IGF-1 receptors, but if there's no IGF-1 around, then uh, may, they uh, may not be able to grow and spread. This may help explain why those eating low-carb diets appear to cut their lives short, but not just any low-carb diets, specifically those based on animal sources, whereas vegetable-based low-carb diets were associated with a lower risk of death. But look, low-carb diets are high in animal fat as well as animal protein, so how do we know it wasn't the saturated animal fat that was killing people off and had nothing to do with the protein? What we need is a study that just follows a few thousand people and their protein intakes for 20 years or so and just see who lives longest, who gets cancer, who doesn't, but there'd never been a study like that until now. 6,000 men and women over age 50 from across the U.S. followed for 18 years, and those under age 65 with high protein intakes had a 75% increase in overall mortality and a fourfold increase in the risk of dying from cancer. But not all proteins. These associations were either abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived, which all makes sense given the higher IGF-1 levels among those eating lots of protein. The sponsoring university sent out a press release with a memorable opening line, that chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette, explaining that eating a diet rich in animal proteins during middle age makes you four times more likely to die from cancer than someone with a low-protein diet, a mortality risk factor comparable to smoking cigarettes. And when they say low-protein diet, what they actually mean is just getting the recommended amount of protein. Almost everyone's going to have a cancer cell or a precancerous cell in them at some point. The question is, does it progress? Said one of the lead researchers, that may depend on what we eat. The question is not whether a certain diet allows you to do well in the short term, one of the researchers noted, but can it help you survive to be 100? It wasn't just more deaths from cancer. Middle-aged people who eat lots of protein from animal sources were found to be more susceptible to early death in general. Crucially, the same did not apply to plant proteins like beans, and it wasn't the fat, but the animal protein that appeared to be the culprit. What was the response to the revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health as smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist replied that it was potentially dangerous. It could damage the effectiveness of important public health messages. Why? Well, a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? It reminds me of the famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day may be three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer, or doubling the risk frequently cooking with oil, or tripling your risk of heart disease eating non-vegetarian, 
or multiplying risk sixfold eating lots of meat and dairy. So they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. The risk of cancer from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. It's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot is so much worse. Right? It's like saying, if you don't wear seatbelts, might as well have unprotected sex. If you go bungee jumping, might as well disconnect your smoke alarms at home. Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you'll note Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Again, protein that injures your blood vessels, damages your heart and kidneys, weakens your bone, raises your blood pressure, increases your risk of developing cancer, diabetes, having a stroke, clearly is not high quality protein. Carnitine, choline, cancer, and cholesterol, and the TMAO connection. Cancer and choline in red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy can be converted by gut bacteria into a toxic compound to called TMAO, trimethylamine uh, oxide, uh, that increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, strokes, and cancer. Vegans do not harbor the strains of bacteria that convert choline or carnitine into this toxic compound. And habitual consumption of choline and carnitine-containing foods well, by people with these bacterial strain has been also shown to increase uh, cancer risk as well as the risk for stroke and heart blood, high blood pressure. So again, you eat the foods, they go into your colon, the bacteria convert them into TMA, the TMA then goes into the liver and gets oxidized into TMAO, which then damages your blood vessels, raises your risk for cancer. Now, plant proteins in their natural state are always accompanied by fiber, and I need you guys to pay close attention to this, because this is slightly uh, t uh, quirky, but it, you, it'll make sense if you, if you kind of follow along. Any plant protein residues delivered to our colon, because they are accompanied by fiber, bacteria in our colon will use the fiber for their energy metabolism. They ferment the fiber, and they take up the protein residues from the plants and use them to make new bacteria. But diets high in animal and dairy, by contrast, generate a host of toxic metabolites, and the reason is that when animal protein residues are delivered to the colon, there is no fiber. And the only thing the bacteria can do with animal protein residues is cause it to rot. And so they putrefy this stuff and generate toxic compounds such as idoxyl sulfate, cresyl sulfate, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and so forth, and these compounds can then be absorbed into the bloodstream where they go into the central nervous system and cause some serious damage. Since the bluebird of happiness long absent from his life, Ned sadly is visited by the chicken of depression. <laughs> Studies have shown that diets high in animal proteins and low in fiber can have a detrimental impact on mood and behavior disorders. And again, these putrefaction of these protein residues releases these toxins that are absorbed and then get into the central nervous system and exacerbate depression and anxiety. And so you end up with uh, a leaky gut mechanism. Lipoprotein polysaccharide is a compound that comes from the bacteria in the colon. And uh, studies show that in people with major depression, they have much higher levels of antibodies to these bacterial compounds than people without, which suggests that a lot more of these bacterial compounds are getting into the bloodstream of people with depression. Well, how does that happen? It turns out that in these colon cells, the cells in our colon prefer to get their energy from the breakdown of fiber. When fiber is broken down into short-chain fatty acids, the first one is butyrate, which is a four-carbon short-chain fatty acid. That is what colonic cells prefer to use for their energy. If there is not enough fiber in the colon, then there's not enough butyrate. If there's not enough butyrate, the colonic cells become sickly. And you see what happens? They can't maintain tight junctions. And so now you've got bacteria slipping down in between into your bloodstream. But you don't just get bacteria, you get protein fragments. Because those protein fragments are similar to our own tissues, we make antibodies against them. Those antibodies can sometimes cross-react with our own tissues and cause autoimmune disease. Anybody got an, any, an idea of what this syndrome is called? Leaky gut because you are literally leaking 
uh, uh, you, you have material in your gut leaking into your bloodstream. So the question was, uh, do psychiatrists either know about this or believe in it? And more and more psychiatrists are, uh, because of, uh, you can see the uh, studies that are being done here are coming to understand this. Um, but again, you know, a lot of doctors are behind the times and it's easier to throw drugs at you than to pay attention to nutrition. So the bottom line is you will always be your own best advocate or the best advocate for your family members. And even if the doctor is, you know, behind the times or stupid, we need to know the truth and make sure that we're doing the right thing. Inflammation and inflammatory mediators can also alter the blood-brain barrier permeability and make it more likely that these toxic compounds will get into the brain. Now this is something that is really super important. This is a nerve cell. This is the axon from the nerve cell where the signal is transmitted to another nerve cell. Just like this electrical cord down on the floor, the axon has to be insulated in order for the nerve signal to travel efficiently. The insulation around our nerve cells is this stuff called myelin. Myelin is made by uh, central nervous system cells called oligodendrocytes. Well, studies show that when people eat too much animal protein and they start to get these uh, protein residues delivered to the colon, you get the putrefaction, the absorption of the toxins, those toxins prevent the oligodendrocytes from making the myelin uh, sheaths for these cells and you basically get a disruption of uh, central nervous system signaling and that presents as mood and behavioral disorders. Behavioral changes and changes in brain chemistry that are consistent with depression and anxiety disorders have been induced and reproduced in the brains of experimental animals by alterations of their gut microbiome. Selecting for bacterial strains such as Clostridales and these other unpronounceable ones show that they create these highly toxic, permeable, toxic met metabolites such as Cresol. Cresol has been shown to impair the ability of these oligodendrocytes to, number one, form in the first place, and two, actually make the myelin sheaths that surround our nerve axon. And these transcriptional changes resulted in decreased uh, adult myelination in mice. The behaviors exhibited in these animals were consistent with mood and behavior disorder uh, that we see in human beings. And this is the reference for the study. Very, very, very super important study here because it's really demonstrating the mechanism by which uh, animal food-based diet results in demonstrable changes in the brain that result in mood and behavior disorders. Well, healthy kidneys filter about half a cup of blood every minute, removing waste and extra water to make urine. And uh, that happens because blood flows into this little tuft of capillaries here inside this capsule and about 40% of the fluid flowing through the capsule comes out, okay? And, and then it starts flowing down that tube and our body pulls back everything it wants to keep, everything that's left over is uh, urine. And so that's how the kidneys help maintain a balance of sodium, calcium, phosphorus, and potassium. But it turns out that animal fat can actually alter the structure of the kidney and animal protein delivers an acid load that can result in scarring. You see this? You see how now these, this little, these capillaries are becoming scarred? And as they become scarred, they can't do their job and you get something called glomerular sclerosis and that leads to kidney dysfunction and ultimately kidney damage and if it's not uh, stopped, kidney failure. Uh, but if you, in, if you take in an equal amount of plant protein, it doesn't have the same effects. And that's also why people with kidney dysfunction, if they go on a plant-based diet, they can stop and even reverse the kidney dysfunction. There's actually been cases of people who were uh, getting ready for a kidney transplant who became plant-based and were able to stay off the transplant list. And then last night, Michael talked about branched-chain amino acids. Well, we know that high protein diets are associated with impaired glucose uh, tolerance and insulin resistance that leads to diabetes. The leucine, isoleucine, and valine are your branched chain amino acids, and the addition of branched chain amino acids to a high fat diet contributes to the development of insulin resistance and can lead to type 2 diabetes. 
High consumption of dietary branched chain amino acids may also increase the risk of insulin resistance leading to both the metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And there's also an accumulating body of evidence that shows that branched chain amino acids are essential nutrients for cancer growth and that they're used by tumors in various biosynthetic pathways and also as a short source of energy. Research has found an association between an increased level of branched chain amino acids and increased risk of pancreatic cancer, particularly when the increase was observed at 10 years before diagnosis. So that, in other words, what they're saying is that the longer you are taking in too many of these branched chain amino acids, the uh, higher your risk. Now, um, the one piece that I did not get a chance to include in this slide was where you get the highest sources of branched chain amino acids. Can anybody guess? Meat, eggs, and dairy. The usual suspects. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not hard. It's very straightforward and it's completely consistent. If we want to be healthy, we want to live long, we want to be in our right mind, we need to stop eating animal protein. Oh gosh. I was told I can't make certain comments about certain people, but let me just. <laughs> let me just say there's certain people I would love to feed a whole lot of meat, eggs, and dairy. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yes, branched chain amino acids because they're they're very they're found in very high levels in muscle tissue. So a lot of bodybuilders do take them, but they shouldn't be. They shouldn't do that. All right. So again, all plant proteins have been shown to have a beneficial effect on our cholesterol level, uh, bone health, exercise, physiology, immune function, kidney function, colon health, bowel function, reduce the risk for diabetes, improve vascular health, acid-base balance, decrease cancer risk, heart disease risk, risk for dementia and Alzheimer's, depression and mood and behavior disorders. And hopefully we'll end up looking like those people too. <laughs> all right. One last video. There's been a history of enthusiasm for protein in the nutrition world. A century ago, the protein requirements were more than twice what we know them to be today. This enthusiasm peaked in the 1950s, and with the United Nations identifying protein deficiency as a serious widespread global problem. There was a protein gap that needed to be filled. This was certainly convenient for the U.S. dairy industry, who could dump their post-war surplus of dried milk onto the third world, rather than having to just bury it. But this led to the great protein fiasco. There was a disease of malnutrition called kwashiorkor that was assumed to be caused by protein deficiency, famously discovered by Dr. Cicely Williams, who spent the latter half of her life debunking the very condition that she first described. Turns out there's no real evidence of dietary protein deficiency. The actual cause of kwashiorkor remains obscure, but fecal transplant studies suggest changes in gut flora may be a causal factor. How could the field of nutrition have gotten it so spectacularly wrong? A famous editorial about the profession started with these words. The dispassionate objectivity of scientists is a myth. No scientist is simply involved in the single-minded pursuit of truth. He or she is also engaged in the passionate pursuit of research, grants, and professional success. Uh, nutritionists may wish to attack malnutrition, but they also wish to earn their living in ways they find congenial. This inevitably encourages researchers to make a case for the importance of their own portion of the field and their nutrient, which was protein. Science eventually prevailed, though, and there was a massive recalculation of human protein requirements in the 1970s, which at the stroke of a pen closed the so-called protein gap and destroyed the theory of this pandemic of protein malnutrition. Infant protein requirements went from a recommended 13% of daily calories down to 10%, then 7%, and then down to 5%.
However, to this day, there are still those obsessing about protein. Those promoting paleolithic diets, for example, try to make the case for protein from an evolutionary perspective. OK, so let's ask the question. What is the perfect food for human beings? The food that was fine-tuned just for us, and for millions of years to have the perfect amount of protein? Human breast milk. If high-quality protein was the nutrient among nutrients, helping us build our big brains over the last few million years, one would expect that importance to be resoundingly reflected in the composition of human breast milk, especially since infancy is the time of our most rapid growth. But this is patently not the case. Human breast milk is one of the lowest protein milks in the mammalian world. In fact, it may have the lowest protein concentration of any animal in the world, less than 1% protein by weight. This is one of the reasons why feeding straight cow's milk to babies can be so dangerous. The protein content in human milk is described as extremely low, but it's not low at all. It's right where it needs to be. That's the natural, normal level for the human species fine-tuned over millions of years. Adults require no more than 0.8 or 0.9 grams of protein per healthy kilogram of body weight per day. So uh, that's like your ideal weight in pounds multiplied by 4 and then divided by 10. Uh, so someone whose ideal weight is 100 pounds may require up to 40 grams of protein a day. On average, they probably only need about 30 grams a day, which is 0.66 grams per kilogram, but we say 0.8 or 0.9 because everyone's different, and we want to capture most of the bell curve. People are more likely to suffer from protein excess than protein deficiency. The adverse effects associated with long-term high-protein diets may include disorders of bone and calcium balance, disorders of kidney function, increased cancer risk, disorders of the liver, and worsening of coronary artery disease. Therefore, there is currently no reasonable scientific basis to recommend protein consumption above the current recommended daily allowance due to its potential disease risks. Well, one in four Americans eats fast food every day, and this uh, clerk presciently asks, he says, I'll have the half pound double deluxe bacon steer burger. He says, you want some chemotherapy with that. Uh, fast foods are very high in animal protein and sugar, high in saturated and trans fat, and of course that increases our risk for all of the usual problems. Uh, and fast foods are usually specifically designed to be addictive and should be avoided at all costs. And let's look at some plant protein sources. You have grains, nuts, vegetables, and legumes. And I've divided them into concentrated versus dilute. So your concentrated are your legumes, grains, seitan, nuts, seeds, tofu, tempeh, textured vegetable protein. Less concentrated, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, potatoes, root vegetables, asparagus, artichokes, and so on, but they all still have uh, protein. So we got some nutrient profiles from various legumes. All right, here we go with the next set of beans. I just want y'all to know that that looks kind of elegant. It took me hours. <laughs> All right, here come your nuts. And what about fish? Don't eat it. These data on BMAA neurotoxin concentrations in animals in South Florida waters indicate that the situation in Guam is not unique. It looks like BMAA could be found in high concentrations in aquatic animals in many areas of the world. This could explain ALS clustering around lakes in New Hampshire, up to 25 times the expected rate of ALS, with some families eating fish several times a week or in Wisconsin, where the most significant ALS risk factor was the past consumption of fish out of Lake Michigan, or 
clustering in Finland's Lakeland district, or maybe seafood eaters in France, or around the Baltic Sea, building up particularly in fish mussels and oysters. When I think algae blooms, I think uh, the Chesapeake Bay, near where I live, that gets choked off, thanks in part to the uh, poultry industry pollution. And indeed, there was a recent report linking BMAA exposure to ALS in Maryland. Uh, ALS victims living within a half mile of each other raised some eyebrows at the Hopkins ALS Center. Uh, the victims each ate uh, Chesapeake blue, uh, Bay blue crabs every week, and so they tested a few, and two out of the three crabs tested positive for BMAA, indicating that the neurotoxin is present in the aquatic food chain of the Chesapeake Bay and a potential route for human exposure. To bring the story full circle, things in Guam are looking up. The ALS epidemic there may have been triggered by their acquisition of guns. But now the epidemic appears to be over thanks to the near extinction of fruit bats due to overhunting. But while the rates decline in Guam, neurodegenerative diseases like ALS around the rest of the world are on the rise. It's plausible that humans have been exposed to some level of BMAA through our evolutionary history, but the increase in algae blooms as a result of human activities is probably increasing this exposure. There's a general consensus that harmful algal, algal blooms are increasing worldwide thanks in part to industrialized agriculture. More people means more sewage, fertilizer, manure, uh, which may mean more algae, which may mean more exposure to this neurotoxin, leading to a possible increased incidence of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. BMAA is a strong contender as the cause of, or at least a major contributor to the cause of both endemic and sporadic ALS and Alzheimer's disease, and possibly conferring risk for Parkinson's disease as well. The ramifications of this discovery are enormous. With substantial and ever-growing evidence that BMAA does play a role in the onset and progression of neurodegenerative diseases, the most important question is, what mode of activity does BMAA exert? What? <laughs> no, it's not. The most important question is how do we reduce our risk? We know that the presence of BMAA in aquatic food chains could be a significant human health hazard. There may even be a synergistic toxicity between mercury and BMAA, making certain fish even riskier. Until more is known about the possible link of BMAA to Alzheimer's and ALS, it may be prudent to limit exposure of BMAA in the human diet. So this is about vegan diets and exercise. All of these diets are isocaloric, meaning they have the same number of calories. So what about exercise and endurance? On the high-fat, all-protein, uh, animal food-based diet, the uh, athletes were only able to exercise about a maximum of 60 minutes. If you add in some carbohydrate, you see that you double the workout time. But if you switch to an all-carbohydrate diet, you triple the workout time, because you have maximal energy, uh, muscle energy. Question is, can vegans get buff? You bet they can. It says grasses and leaves, just look at them. And so here are some uh, uh, vegetarian and vegan bodybuilders and athletes just showing you that uh, you, there's no problem putting on uh, muscle mass uh, on a plant-based diet. Uh, this is a, a German bodybuilder by the name of Alexander Dargat. This is Albert Beckles, he former Mr. Universe. Uh, it's Brendan Brazier. Brendan used to come to uh, Summerfest, but he hasn't been here in a while. He's a triathlete. Yes, he does. And this is Kenneth Williams, who's a vegan bodybuilder. I love what his shirt says. Uh, Katie Coriel is a vegan surfer.
Now, Katra Corbett is an amazing runner, but I think she's a little crazy because she ran 212 miles from Yosemite to Mount Whitney and then ran back. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Seba Johnson, who was the first African-American uh, skier on the U.S. Olympic team. Uh, and Seba is a dedicated vegan, and at one point she refused to compete because the uniforms included uh, material made from seals. And then there's Dr. Ruth Heydrich, who cured herself of breast cancer on a vegan diet and is, uh, has been named one of the 10 fittest women. She, this, this slide is rather old. I think she's now in her 80s, actually, and still going strong. NFL star Derek Morgan is linebacker for the Tennessee Titans. Um, he transitioned to a vegan diet because he was interested in weight control and in, and in uh, exercise recovery. And he found that the more vegan he became, the better he felt and the better he performed on field. And so he became completely vegan. And that then uh, spurred his wife to become vegan. And then his teammates saw how, how, uh, how much his uh, on-game performance improved. And so about somewhere between 12 to 17 of them also went on a vegan diet. And then there are a number of uh, current and former NBA players who've also adopted a vegan diet for improved performance, such as Don Sally, Kyrie Irving, uh, Damian Lillard, uh, Wilson Chandler, Al Jefferson, Garrett Temple, Ennis Cantor, Javel McGee, and Jahil Okafer. And so again, if you go vegan, nobody gets hurt. All right, so in closing, I just want to say it can be argued that the greatest successes in the history of modern medicine have always been preventive rather than curative. We were to calculate total life you're saved through various modalities. You see that we save many more lives with prevention than we do in trying to cure people. There's no question that surgery, antibiotics, and all that stuff is important and necessary, but there's also no question that the majority of disease and death we see are related to the way we eat and live, and that if we change the way we eat and live, we could prevent a lot of the ill health. And I always remind people, nobody ever asks for fried chicken, ice cream, french fries, or pork chop in the delivery room. Everything we think we like, somebody taught us to like, and just like we were taught to like unhealthy foods, we can learn to like healthier foods, and we have to do this for our own health and well-being and for the benefit of the planet and its other inhabitants. And I'll leave you with this picture. <laughs> All right, listen, thank you guys for staying. I hope you had a wonderful time. Uh, at Summerfest this year, and I'll see you all next year. Bye. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. You guys have to go. Mm. Yeah, take care. All right. Drive, drive safely. You too. Especially with this rain, okay? It was really a pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. And you guys, everybody who's driving, please drive safely. It's very wet out there. Where do you have to drive back to? Uh, DC. Oh, okay. And, and, I, and for those of you who know me, I'm going to drive slowly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just an anecdotal thing. Uh -huh. Years ago, I worked in dialysis, and the person in charge of, you know, education, yeah. blah, 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 she said that they had noticed that recently, uh, this was in the 70s, uh -huh. um, a lot of doctors were putting diabetics on high-protein diets. Yes, they were, and, and that was the worst. Failure, went. Everybody, everybody was coming in, all, a lot, I mean, diabetics all uh -huh. come in with right. kidney failure, but but these people, there were a number It just of them pushed them right over the edge, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's, it was one of the worst trends ever. Yeah, it, 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 I, I mean, it was horrible. Yeah.